Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Really, this is such an amazing pleasure by any standard. All gatherings, it's always wonderful on campus. And here to actually see people in person is extraordinary. Um, and we're so glad to have so many of you here. See, see familiar faces, not quite as familiar behind a mask, uh, <laughs> but really, really lovely. I'm David Ackerley, Dean of Rouser College of Natural Resources. And we are here to welcome you to a long overdue 30th anniversary celebration for the Department of Plant and Microbial Biology. I do want to pause before we continue and acknowledge that for many, many people, today is also an anniversary, the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, and many people are marking today in a much more somber way than we are, and I actually want to pause for a brief moment to acknowledge and recognize that. And when we think about our role and our role at Berkeley and our role in academia, these are not unconnected events because the world is a much more divided place than it was uh, 20 years ago, both within the country and around the world. And if, I think all of us know that one of the things we do in the university is we are part of a global community and we are one of the really important ways that people bridge across nations, across cultures, and um, I know it's a shared commitment by all to be part of trying to bring the world closer together and heal some of those divides. So technically speaking, this is the 32nd year of PMV. Um, we, were, uh, we were going to celebrate a year ago, which was even then technically a year late, but that's okay. Because really we're here to celebrate the future and look forward to uh, many more decades ahead. Um, PMB, as you all know, is one of five departments in Rouser College, um, and it has a long and distinguished and remarkable history and a history of extremely distinguished faculty and extraordinary research, which continues and is uh, going full steam as we speak. Um, I'm, a, I'm definitely a fan of history, and uh, I was not actually at Berkeley in the 80s when we saw so many reorganizations. But under uh, Dick Malkin, a nucleus of faculty came together from botany, from cell physiology, entomology, genetic, genetics, plant pathology, uh, departments that none of us uh, hear about today because those are all gone, and they came together to form plant biology. And under the leadership then of Sidney Kustu, actually, would Kustu or Kustu? That's a question. Thank you. Um, and Bob Buchanan, um, who has been a, a key part of today's celebration. Another group came together to form the Division of Microbiology, and then the two together made PMB in its modern form as plant and microbial biology. Now, as I said, we would have started these celebrations uh, some time ago, uh, or a year ago, but in the meantime, PMB was very active in getting some events going, uh, public events via Zoom on our, you know, the many uh, talks we were all celebrating together and starting last year, it was actually uh, Britt Gossinger gave one of the first of these, of virulent viruses and reservoir hosts, which some of you may have seen at the time and it's still available. Um, but of course, in this moment, uh, PMB's uh, focus on microbial biology was as relevant as ever, and maybe even more so. As, a, as a, one of my colleagues said, before last March, there were five, like five virologists on this campus. And about a month later, there were about 200, apparently. And, and everyone found themselves having a, an interest in this. Um, so I, I do encourage you, if you haven't seen it, to go and look at some of the events that have been, made up the ongoing anniversary celebration. Before we go any further, I want to give my personal thanks to a a uh, very active committee that put together all of today's events and actually ask all of them to stand up. If you were on the organizing committee in any fashion, please stand. I know John, David, uh, some may be already be standing. Catherine and Cassie, uh, Kareen, thank you. Um, Russ, Cheng, yeah, thank you all. As in my role as Dean, I want to especially express again my thanks to John Coates who served as chair for during my first three, three years with Shing as vice chair, and now thank Shing stepping up as chair, and Britt Glossinger as vice chair of the department. It's been an enormous pleasure working with them in leadership. And I can assure you, your interests are well represented in the dean's office. Um, 
So I think without further ado, I will turn it over to John Coates, who has been chairing this effort and who will then introduce our panel. Thank you very much for being here. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, David, for that uh, introductory speech. Uh, we greatly appreciate your comments. Um, <clears throat> welcome to this long-awaited gathering to celebrate our 30th anniversary. And um, I just want to thank everybody for making the effort to come here today. It means an awful lot to us. Uh, as David mentioned, my name is John Coates, and I just ended my term as uh, chair of the department and I'll be the MC for this afternoon, so by the end of the afternoon, you'll probably be sick and tired of hearing my voice. Uh, hopefully, you've already seen the excellent uh, posters that we have had showing here, and you've had a chance to mingle and uh, reignite your previous relationships and uh, have planned some events for later on today. I want to thank the students and the faculty for these posters and the effort that goes into putting them together. And in particular, I'd like to recognize uh, my colleague, Professor Corrine Gibbs, for leading the effort in facilitating these activities and serving on both the PMB Annual Retreat Committee and the 30th Anniversary Celebration Committee to ensure the coordination. Corrine, can you please stand up and take a bow? Thank you. Thank you, Corrine. And I should uh, emphasize that Corrine is a new faculty in our department, so it was quite a remarkable undertaking for somebody who's only been here for a year. So thank you again, Corrine. At this point, I'd also like to invite the members of our retreat committee. Uh, as you know, this is the uh, last day of our retreat. Um, I'd like to invite the members of our retreat committee, Joanne Strawley, the PMB administrative officer, um, Professor Ben Blackman, Professor Ceci Martinez-Gomez, our postdoctoral fellow, uh, Monica Fisher, graduate student, Colin Barber, and uh, the graduate advisor, PMB's graduate advisor, Lynn Rivera, and the department coordinator, Rachel Collette. If you guys could all stand up, please, and take a bow and be recognized for your hard work. Thank you, guys. It's greatly appreciated. So the PMB retreat is an annual event, and the goal of it is really to introduce the incoming graduate students to life in our department and to meet their faculty and peers. And needless to say, uh, this year's retreat really has special meaning for us all, as it's, this is the first departmental-wide in-person event since the uh, beginning of the pandemic. So we not only welcome the new 2021 cohort of graduate students today, but we also recognize the 2020 cohort of graduate students who spent much of their first year uh, in isolation. We really congratulate you and, and we appreciate your patience and resilience during this very difficult uh, time. You were truly not the forgotten cohort like I've heard you describe yourselves in the past. So congratulations, guys. Okay, in a few minutes, we'll enjoy a keynote presentation uh, by a, a PMB alumnus, Professor Jing Wang Deng of Peking University. And then we'll move on to a special panel discussion that offers really some insight into PMB's contributions to the shaping of our modern world. But before we do that, I'd like to um, reflect on a few things myself. The last 18 months have really been quite extraordinary for us all and they've really been a true test of our resilience. So I want to take a moment here to really acknowledge the PMB community and to extend our warmest welcomes to everybody here today. On behalf of the planning committee, and to thank you for accepting the, retreat, uh, the invitation to this event. It really is a great honor to see everybody here, and we hope that all of you, alumni, colleagues, students, uh, parents, and friends, enjoy yourselves. And please know you're all most welcome. Our goal with this event was really to celebrate 30, 30 years of achievements of the department. And as David mentioned, this is really our 32nd year. Um, we had fully intended to do a big in-person event last, this time last year. 
but um, then the university uh, closed down as a result of the pandemic. So the committee actually began working on this over two years ago. And the committee met uh, on a bi-weekly base uh, for the last 18 months to plan a ver uh, various things. Now we obviously, because of the pandemic, we had to do a rapid pivot and move everything to an online. And as David mentioned, we've had saw a, a great series of online events um, programs to mark the special departmental lives, uh, milestone. So I hope that you'll check out these. If you haven't had a chance to, you'll check out these events. They are all uh, archived online on our departmental website, pmb.berkeley.edu. So please do check them out if you get a chance. These events were developed in a fireside chat forum and focused on highly relevant topics, including the one David mentioned, virulent viruses, um, but we also had an event on genome editing and sustainable agriculture. We had an event on the role of social media in science communication. And we had a, uh, a walking event, if you want, um, of the fascinating world of fungi and their role in health and nutrition. And we wrapped up this series then last May with a career panel which was composed of nine PMB alumni from a, a diversity of career fields who answered many questions and uh, from attending graduate students and postdocs regarding job opportunities in their various fields. So right now what I'd like to do is to thank the various faculty, student and alumni panelists who've played a role in these various events over the last 18 months. And particularly I'd like to call out Professor Brick Glossinger Professor Brian Staskowitz, Professor Pam Ronald, Dr. Kat Adams, Professor Arash Kamali, Professor Cameron Thrash, Dr. Iman Sylvain, Professor John Taylor, Professor Tom Bruns, and Dean Ackerley as well. So thank you all for your efforts and your help in these events. So I really want to particularly welcome the amazing students and postdocs and to remind you guys you are truly the basis of this department and have been throughout the entire history of this department. I really am delighted that we can share this event with you today and we look forward to continued interactions with you uh, in the future. I also want to welcome our alumni and let you guys know that watching you flourish in your various careers has been a great pride of the department. We are nothing if we, uh, we can't watch that. Your success is our success, and every measure of uh, our success is based on your achievements. And we hope that today represents the continuation of a long engagement into the future. And obviously to my colleagues, both past and present, your expertise, your energy, and scientific ende endeavor is very much appreciated and truly is the core of this department and has been throughout its history and will be into the future. On behalf of the PMB community, we want to offer you thanks for all the wonderful professional and personal contributions you make to the daily, um, on a daily basis to the research and educational mission of our department and to the university. And finally then, I'd like to welcome our many new PMB faculty who ha have joined us during the most difficult of times over the last 18 months and who, this is really their first um, visual representation of the department as a whole. So please join me in, in welcoming Professor Rachel Brem, Professor Ben Williams, Professor Corrine Gibbs, Professor Ceci Martinez Gomez, and Professor Patrick Shee. If you guys can stand up and ex accept a round of applause. These individuals moved to Berkeley in the last 18 months and set up their labs during uh, really the most extremely ch challenging of circumstances. And I personally want to thank them as chair for uh, working with me uh, and are showing great patience as we work through the difficult logistics of relocating them from their various um, places to come to Berkeley. 
And then finally, I, I would like to uh, congratulate our many retiring members of the faculty. So Professor Pat Zambrisky, Professor Shauna Somerville, Professor Peter Quayle, Professor Stephen Lindau, Professor Tom Bruns, Professor John Taylor, and Professor Norman Terry. Congratulations. Thank you for everything you've done for our department throughout its history. And thank you for your willingness to continue to be engaged in the department into the future. We really appreciate everything you do and are looking forward to continuing to work with you. So again, let's give them a round of applause. And now I'm truly honored and thrilled to hand over to my colleague and the new chair of our department, Professor Sheng Luan. Sheng. Yeah, over here. All right, Sheng. Thanks, John, and hello, everyone. For those of you I haven't met before, I'm Sheng Luan, a professor of plant biology for how many years? Gee, 27? It's been a while, right? Um, I'm, as John also said, of course, I'm also the new chair of PMB. Um, working with John in the past three years as an associate chair, I thought I figured out everything about being department chair. So I stepped up. It turned out that was not the case. I was wrong. In the past two months, just, right, I was constantly feeling that I'm a new kid on the block, learning new things every day, challenged by new situations. But that's what we, we all do, right? Learning new things all the time. That's also why our university has been in business for more than 150 years since its funding as an institution of higher learning. So we realize actually we're in the business that we're playing an infinite game here. There's no finish line because learning has no limit. So like our great, great university, PNB has been doing great. As you heard from John and David, uh, I'm not going to repeat all those achievements and uh, appreciation for our community. But one thing for sure, um, the new faculty we recruited during the past few years will immensely balance our faculty structure together with outstanding grad students, postdoc and staff support, I'm sure PMB will continue its legacy of excellence into the future. Uh, as a department, in the past few years, so we've been through a number of uh, uh, crises, including the pandemic. But through this crisis, we become a more tighter, a more tight community, right? We've been uh, grown and developed stronger bond uh, among the community members. So I really think the community PNB has become a community uh, with uh, a lot of common goals and values to become a place for all of us to thrive in pursuing excellence in research and education while fostering a very diverse and inclusive culture. So how to measure excellence in uh, research and education. For research, it might be easier, right? So that's measured or determined by the uh, discoveries and the innovations right here on campus. But quality of, of education is a little more complex. It's determined not only by our students on campus, but also depends how well they do after they graduate and become our alumni. As John said, when they succeed, we get the credit, right? When, we, when PMB is ranked as a top world leading program, that means 
we have been training world leaders in our field. As we celebrate our 30th anniversary today, so we're so proud to see so many of our alumni becoming world leading figures in whatever they do. So now it's my honor to introduce one of such outstanding alumni, Professor Xing Wang Deng, who received both PhD and postdoc training here in our department, 30 years ago, actually, exactly. Um, that set a foundation for his extraordinary successful faculty career at Yale University. His research transformed our understanding how plants respond to light, just like we don't like light, you know, this is, this is too strong. So you can imagine that there are so many things in common between animal and a plant. And his dis discovery actually also shaped our knowledge how animal do their signal transduction mechanism. So we really um, kind of uh, uh, didn't realize, you know, animal and plant share so much in common before his work. And he received a numerous award, including being elected to the National Academy of Science. And uh, he's currently a founding director of Beijing University Institute of Advanced Agriculture. Uh, we invited him as a keynote speaker for today's event, but unfortunately, he cannot be with us in person because of travel restrictions associated with the epidemic. Instead, he sent us a short video to serve as an opening remark for our celebration. Please watch. I hope you enjoy it. Dear members of UC Berkeley Plant and Microbial Biology Community and esteemed guests, greetings. It is my distinct honor to be addressing to you today and providing some welcome remarks for what is our non now we did in person celebration of the PMB's 30th anniversary. My name is Xinwang Deng. I'm the director of the School of Advanced Agricultural Sciences at the Peking University. An alumni of the department having started the PhD program in the fall of 1985 and received my PhD from UCB in 1989. And noting the irony that my remarks for this in-person celebration are pre-recorded due to the traveling restrictions caused by the pandemic. Allow me to say how great it is to be with you on this special day today. As I said, I received my doctorate from Carl in 89 after four fantastic years learning and growing professionally and personally as part of a PMB's community of scientists. Berkeley, 1989, it was such a happy time in my life. Not only was I learning from the dedicated fellow students and expert professors, in fact, Professor Grusen was my mentor and a doctorate advisor and Dick Markin was my PhD committee member and as well as the director of a graduate study. Thank you, Dick. But I was also married to my wife, Dr. Ning Wei, a fellow PhD student of the program. 1989, what was happening after that year? I want to switch to a few PPT slides for sharing with you all. I want to introduce a few PPT slides uh, talking about what happened after 1989. Where am I? So as I said, uh, I complete my PhD on 89. Afterwards, I went to the Plant Gene Expression Center, uh, USDA Berkeley Joint Venture uh, for postdoc. So this lasts until the end of 91. Uh, in January of 92, I went to Yale University, joined the faculty there, uh, working through the assistant professor, social professor, full professor, and eventually ended with an adult professorship. Uh, in April 2013, I was elected to the Academy of the U.S. Academy of Sciences. And after that, uh, July 1st, 2014, I uh, I resigned from the Yale and joined the faculty of a Peking University. So why is this happening that? I 
that has to do where I was from. Uh, this is a picture showing the hometown where I uh, grew up, uh, the, the house here, and the, 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 the view from the front porch. So it is evident that this is a, a small mountain village uh, where I grew up. So I was very passionate about the countryside, the village, the, the farmers, and I always wanted to do something to improve and change the situation there. The memories of my home village, uh, these are the, the things that I was in country when I was young, the uh, plowing the night, planting the rice and sort of things, uh, herd the sheep, and doing all the uh, routine uh, uh, farm duties, uh, the childhood pictures. So, so I wanted to do something that would improve and help the farmers, the village. So the first thing I came to Peking University was to, uh, do, uh, do, to suggest and uh, get approved to set up a school of advanced agricultural sciences, Peking University. This was founded October 14, 2014. So about three months I joined the faculty. The two disciplines that uh, was actively set up in the last seven years or so was the agricultural economics and the policy studies and the agrobiotechnology and the plant molecular genetics. This is the area that I'm interested and in, educate for. One idea that is coming up during that early time is that the research and development need to be done uh, in the forefront of agriculture. So after I joined the Peking University and just a year after the, that date in July 23rd, 2015, I visited the Weifan of Shandong province and I'm looking for the, a new site for uh, set up a new research institute. And indeed, I find this is the right place because it's, Shandong is the biggest agricultural related uh, province and Weifan is the leading city in that area. So this is just a perfect place. So starting then, uh, and until the June of 2018, uh, several years, we went through a serious discussion involving Weifan, Shandong Province, Tedeville University, Peking University, and uh, eventually agreed up to build up a new campus for the Institute and also get the approval of an annual budget uh, for the Institute. The, Construction began in, 18, uh, in 2018, uh, June 15, 2018. And uh, excitingly, it was uh, done in three years and uh, we moved in July 10, 2021. So this is just about two months ago. So this is great new place. I want to show you, the, uh, this is just in the process once the negotiation and agreement signing event. This is the governor of the Shandong province then. Uh, this is me uh, representing Peking University sign this collaboration. So where is the site? The site is in Shandong province in China, north, north side of China. Uh, in Shandong province is the Weifang. Uh, district of Weifang is a one the big area. Uh, in the Weifang, so this we, we find there's a big lake uh, 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 on the very north side of the lake, of the, uh, this is the city that we found. And we find the location, so, so this is a little peninsula, okay, right here on the north side of the lake, and we find the peninsula, it's the perfect location. And this is before the construction start. So it's just the uh, wideness land over there. And this are the, uh, the, uh, the, the location where the uh, institute is going to be located. So it's a perfect location in the waterfront with a, a, a small hills on the back, uh, this is what it looks today. So it's a waterfront. Uh, it's a very nice campus of 80 acres or so. And the, 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 this is here on the backside. And this is the, the, the high here, the highest mountain in the Shasan in the area. This is the Shasan mountain. Okay, so this is a beautiful, beautiful place. And the institute is get going uh, quickly. Uh, we, our goal is have 20 to 30 laboratories with uh, about 500 staff members. Uh, and currently, we already 
uh, uh, achieving 17 naps by the uh, end of this month, so September. So we are actually has a great bunch of the PIs, the scientists, myself and Xinping Zhang and Wang Ging, those are two senior members coming from the international uh, seed companies. And those new guys, there's a Sussin Chen and Huawei Zhang, those are Sussin from the UC Davis, Huawei from the Chinese Academy of Science. Those are excellent, brilliant young PIs. I hope you all like the PPD photos and the uh, short videos. Uh, this is the new location where I spent most of my time to, nowadays. One lesson I have taken away from those 18 months or so is the world is a small village. Good science conducted by good people for the public good is not only boldness, it is our best way forward. And when I say our best way forward, I'm referring to our entire planet. Our scientists have shown and continue to show time and time again, the value of doing strong science, of doing the right thing, science as international diplomacy. I'm so proud to be part of the community that is always asking how and who we it can help. Who can we empower today so that our scientists champions can do more to advance the public good tomorrow. So I invite you, dear friends, to raise a glass or wave a napkin or just clap your hands and share a smile with person next to you. I invite you to celebrate PMP's glorious 30 years history while envision the next 30 glorious years as our community of global scientists, our scientist ambassadors, continue to link hands, minds, and test tube, no doubt, to usher in a brave and exciting and inclusive new world. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your special day. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sheng, and thank you, Professor Ding, for that wonderful presentation. So we'll now move on to the panel discussion event for this afternoon, and I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator, who will then introduce the panelists. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Professor Rich Lyons, uh, who's a professor and former dean of the Haas School of Business. In 2020, Rich became Berkeley's first chief innovative and entrepreneurship officer. And while he continues to hold the William and Janet Cronk Chair in Innovative Leadership in, in Haas. Rich is truly at the forefront of applied biological sciences and entrepreneurial activities here on campus. And he recently oversaw the creation of the new Baker Bioingenuity Hall, our hub, which is a full service small business incubator. This facility is housed in the Wu Han Fei Hall which is the former home of uh, the University Art Museum uh, over on the other side of campus. Rich is very engaged across campus on scientific innovation and application to the benefit of society, and Rich is one of the primary reasons for why UC Berkeley was recently ranked the number two school in the world for entrepreneurs by PitchBook in their 2020 university rankings. Today, I have the great pleasure and pride to uh, introduce Rich, who will moderate our panel discussion entitled Fermenting Change, the PMB Way, From Lab to Living Room. Rich. Thank you, John, and thanks to the whole department. It's a pleasure for me to be here, and I do get to introduce this remarkable panel. Uh, just a couple of quick comments before I do, though. Um, you know, I was an undergrad here at Berkeley, and I wish I had seen what you've seen, all of you have seen, some of you really just getting started. So I'm an economist. That was the field I chose. Uh, the field you chose and are choosing, those of you that are just getting started, uh, is obviously a world-changing field. It is a, a future-making field. It, it is exciting for me now in my current role, sort of stepping out of my economics role, to be playing, as John mentioned, 
this innovation and entrepreneurship role on campus because it plugs me into the science that's going on, the science that you are doing and of course others are doing and I couldn't be more excited about it. And you all have read the same kinds of things that I have about this next decade, if not the next few decades, are gonna be defined by fields just like you. That's exciting for me, so thank you for, uh, for uh, bringing me on today. Um, one quick comment for those of you that are, that are maybe just arriving as postdocs or new faculty, if, if I could just give you one suggestion, and that is there's a website called Begin at Berkeley, begin.berkeley.edu. Our innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem, as they call it, is it, it, it's head spinning. It's so involved. If you go to that website, it's all about what resources can you use, how can you navigate the whole campus, and obviously more specifically around your field. Enough said about that. Let me introduce the panel and the topic here, because that's why I'm here. Fermenting change the PMB way from lab to living room. That's our topic for this panel. We have three absolutely extraordinary panelists that I get to introduce here. So I will go ahead and get started. You know, I think it would help to have the panelists come up now. So if uh, Louise Glass would come up, Uwe Wong and Chris Niogi would, if you'd come up now, that would be great as we can get started and I'll introduce them. That way you can be looking at them as I tell you just a little bit about what they're doing. Now many of you know these three people, they're very well known people, but, I, but it is important for me to give you a little bit of background so you know where they're coming from. Louise, Louise Glass is a professor in PMB here at Berkeley, come on up, thank you. And a senior faculty scientist in the Environmental Genomics and Systems Biology Division at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. She received her PhD from UC Davis in plant pathology and performed her postdoctoral work at the University of Wisconsin on fungal genetics and molecular biology. Recruited to Berkeley, 1999, from the University of British Columbia. It was their biotechnology lab. Louise's work has been focused on dissecting transcriptional regulatory networks in filamentous fungi associated with nutrient acquisition and plant biomass deconstruction using systems biology approaches. This work has applications to industrial, industrially relevant fungi for bioenergy, uh, for industrial enzyme and protein product, production and many other areas. Professor Glass is an international leader in systems biology approaches to fungal genetics, genomics, and applications of fungi to bioenergy. Biofuels and the environment as well. She is the Fred Dickinson Chair of Wood Science and Technology, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology, a fellow of the Mycological Society of America, and was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 2021. Uwe Wong. Dr. Wong graduated from UC Berkeley with a PhD in microbiology from Professor Coates' lab, that was 2018. After spending several years elucidating the molecular mechanisms of microbial perchlorate respiration, he transitioned his research focus from environmental microbiology to bioprocessing. He leveraged the fundamental knowledge of microbial metabolism to build applied molecular tools, including a contamination control technology that prevents microbial contamination in bioreactors. After graduating from Berkeley, Uwe founded PowBio, a startup that provides intelligent fermentation services to the growing synthetic biology industry. PowBio helps synthetic biology companies to test, to validate, and to optimize their fermentation processes and to produce their first kilogram of product. Chris Nayogi. Chris is a professor also in PMB, an HHMI investigator. Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and a faculty scientist in the Molecular Biophysics and Integrated Bioimaging Division at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. His lab uses unicellular algae and plants as experimental organisms to study how photosynthesis is regulated and how photosynthesis might be improved to help increase food production and carbon sequestration. He received his BA in bio biology from Johns Hopkins, an MPhil in biochemistry from the University of Cambridge, and PhD in biology from MIT. He did postdoctoral research at the Carnegie Institution's Department of Plant Biology at Stanford. Since joining the faculty at Berkeley in 1997, he has received a Presidential Early Career Award for scientists and engineers, a Searle Scholar Award, the Melvin Cal Calvin Award from the International Society 
of Photosynthesis Research and the Charles Albert Scholl Award from the American Society of Plant Biologists. Fellow of ASPB Award, he has been elected as a Fellow of AAAS and the National Academy of Sciences. He teaches the genetics section of Bio1A, General Biology, upper division lecture, and lab courses on algal biology, and a graduate seminar on plant and microbial photosynthesis. Three absolutely remarkable people, uh, a, a, a fun topic when thinking about sort of the frontiers. So I'll start, I'll start with the department and, and this question. So there is, there is a unique PMB way of doing things. As, as you think about what that looks like from your perspective, whether it's a little bit more researchy or a little bit more on the alumni side, what is this secret sauce? What is it that makes PMB so special? Why don't we start with you, Louise? Great. <laughs> um, yeah, it was really, these questions are really great because they helped me reflect my career at PMB. And um, I think the secret sauce is the department itself and the colleagues and the graduate students and the postdocs in this department. You guys are amazing. Um, and it's, it's a highly collaborative, highly um, forward-looking uh, community that asks, what if, what can we do? You know, so, so don't recognizing limitations, but actually recognizing opportunities. And so I've been really the beneficiary of many of those opportunities over the last 20 years, um, including Novartis, EBI, the proximity of Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and interaction with scientists up there. It's all been, and other departments on campus. It's really been uh, a fantastic journey for me. Thanks for that. Uwe, how about, please. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Rick, for the uh, introduction. So um, for me, I think there are two major aspects of um, the secret sauce from PMB. One is um, the emotional support. Uh, the other one is the connection. So we are a fairly small um, department, relatively speaking, um, so that everyone knows everybody. So even for me, uh, I'm a super introvert. But when I came to PMB, I was still had the opportunity to really uh, speak and know everybody. Um, so that was extremely helpful because, uh, as you know, uh, science, there are up and downs. And the up can be very high and the low can be very low. Like your rotation project may not work until the last week or you may not have good data until you're like the fifth year. So having people that go into a similar process with you and helping you support you is extremely helpful. Uh, not only providing um, scientific helps, but also um, uh, emotional support. Uh, and the second thing is connection. And again, we are a um, relatively small department. Um, uh, department. So um, when we actually, when, for example, when I, um, after I graduate, um, start having professional meetings um, with other people, so, um, if someone else is from PMB, you really realize you're sharing this unique PMB bonds. Uh, for example, a few weeks ago, I actually uh, met Steven Smith from Kathleen Ryan's lab in a professional meeting. <laughs> and then it was like, oh, hi, how are you? And, you know, this connection really goes a long way. And then it doesn't help you to get things done, but it definitely helps you to open doors. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Yeah, I think the, uh, the, the secret for PMB is really in our name, the combination of plant and microbial biology. Um, I think that, especially 30 years ago, was a really unique combination of, of disciplines in a department. And it's one that has since been, uh, well, other departments have tried to replicate. And I, I think that interface between plants and microbes is an extremely crucial one, and it's uh, going to become even more important over the next decades as we grapple with climate change and, and uh, the associated changes in our environment that are happening. Um, yeah, I think e even today, uh, I, I see in all the new faculty that we're hiring that kind of interface between plants and microbes. And uh, I think that combination is just extremely powerful and has led to a lot of our success over the last 30 years. Thanks for that. I think, I think we will go ahead and reverse the order. I won't always go, go to you first, Louise. Thanks for, for taking that first question. So the second question is really about how the research and the teaching landscape have changed. Uh, over the recent years. And I, I just want to call people back to a comment that was made in the introductory remarks about an event on scientific communication and the, you know, how, how uh, social media and other ways of communicating our results have changed. That's just one element of, of how some of the, the landscape has changed. But some thoughts on how that, how that teaching and research landscape have changed for you, Chris. 
Yeah, I think in terms of science communication, uh, one of the big changes has been uh, the move towards open access publishing. I think uh, that's been a really welcome change for the way we do science, and I really am a big fan of open access publishing and putting articles on BioArchive at the time you know, that we're ready to, to share our results with the world. Uh, I'm a little bit old-fashioned in that I don't use a lot of social media for like publicizing the work that our lab does, but uh, I think that's a really uh, nice way to, to communicate, and I, uh, I encourage students and postdocs to, to, to do that, and I don't know, maybe I will get a Twitter account someday. I've been a little bit discouraged from doing that over the last few years, but, uh, but it could be a good idea. Well, there, there are a lot of people quitting such accounts, but in any event, it's uh, used well, it, it can be productive. Uh, over to you, Uwe. Yeah, I think the biggest change is probably people um, taking um, online meetings much more seriously. Um, so, for example, a few um, before the pandemic, whenever um, we have a meeting, if the person I'm not going to the person or the person not coming to me, I always felt uh, you know this, this, they're not taking this opportunity like or this meeting event seriously. But now um, people are really. Um, uh, there's more and more events that are previously impossible, but moving online so that the more people can actually join the event. Uh, so I think that's a great, uh, great change. Thanks. Good example. Louise. So I think uh, both of those spheres have really changed over the past uh, 30 years. Um, when I first started um, at UBC and also here, there wasn't a lot of emphasis placed on teaching. I think that's really changed over the past 20 years. Um, there's a lot more training a lot more integration, a lot more uh, collaboration, and also um, information of what is actually being taught in different classes. And also thinking about, you know, what, what are we actually trying to teach students, um, both at the graduate and undergraduate level? You know, it's just we feed them full of uh, information. Is that really the objective of teaching? And I think that those conversations uh, over the last 20 years have really um, changed how people view teaching. Research, you know, when I first started research, it was uh, my research grant, my project, my lab, and that has also really changed. It's become highly collaborative, um, and uh, that has also been very enriching because you can collaborate with people that have a completely different skill set from you, and their perspective and their ability to contribute to your research program is uh, incredibly beneficial. Uh, and so I think that's also um, a really positive um, uh, aspect of research going forward is that uh, pressure to actually think outside your own personal box. Great examples, all three. Thank you for that. This question is about so-called lab-grown products, which, uh, as we've all seen, there's been an explosion of such products. And could we help us think a little bit, at, whether it's from a health perspective, a climate perspective, or a business perspective, if you prefer? Uh, what, what, what is your current thinking about lab-grown products? And I'll start with you, Uwe. This is very close to your work. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think there's indeed a massive explosion in lab-grown product. Um, um, these days is honestly the best time to start a biotech company working on lab-grown products as long as you have solid preliminary data. Uh, it's um, definitely possible to raise millions of funding to start your own company. Uh, for example, I know um, Kulika Chumwang from, the, um, from um, Glass Lab actually uh, started uh, a um, food additive company. Um, based on synthetic biology. So um, the, there's definitely inspiration to produce uh, high quality, healthy food, and there's inspiration to reduce the um, carbon uh, carbon footprint uh, associated with food production. Um, and the, I think the challenging part is really the business because all these inspirations are really built on the foundation of having a, a solid business model. Um, it is um, relatively straightforward to produce a product at laboratory scale, spending thousands of dollars to produce one grams of meat, which causes uh, a few cents, on, on, honestly. Um, but it's a whole different story when you try to scale up that process to, um, the, to, to a bigger, pro uh, to to scale up and to facing the global market. The market is there, it's a great, um, the market is there and it's a great business model, but then um, the challenge is really, can we have the technology in place and really rush it through within a few years to achieve the um, cost economics that actually make a um, business case? Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris, why don't you go next? Thanks. Yeah, this is a little bit uh, further from yeah my my area of expertise I guess, but I, I'm a I'm yeah, a big fan of uh, plant-based meats and cheeses for example, and I think the the whole space around uh, 
bioproducts and uh, in food ingredients made uh, from plant-based genes and microbial genes is really interesting. Uh, there are a lot of startup companies in this space right now, as, as Uwe mentioned, and uh, I, I really am interested to see where that goes. I think it could make a very significant impact in reducing the carbon footprint of the way we uh, produce and consume food. And this is, if I can just pop in there, I mean, there, this is another area where there's just lots of other departments on campus that are running with some of these themes, right? Engineering just being one of many, many examples. So if that's your area and you're just getting started in it, uh, make sure you're spanning the boundaries on this campus. Uh, please, Louise. Yeah, my perspective is fungal. <laughs> so I'll say that right up front. And it's a super exciting time, in my opinion, to work on fungi. So there are a number of people in my lab who went to work for Perfect Day, which makes vegan ice cream out of fungi, Impossible Foods that makes uh, part of their products out of fermentation of yeast. Of course, with yeast, we have beer, wine, and bread. Um, there are also companies that you're using uh, fungal uh, mushroom leather to make purses, to make tennis shoes. Uh, and I think really the sky is the limit. And so this is, a, I think, actually a really terrific opportunity for postdocs and graduate students in our department to think again, what, what new things, you know, who would, who would think of making ice cream out of a fungus? You know, it's just like there, but that particular company um, is now a multi-million dollar company. So there are lots of opportunities for um, new ideas for using microbes for food, for biofuels, for seed amendments, for carbon sequestration, um, and lots of uh, economic and industrial opportunities for companies to exploit basic research that we do here on campus. Thanks for that. This, this next question is related. That last question was specifically about lab-grown products, as you know. The next question is really about kind of big picture, next five to 10 years, whether you're thinking about research in, in your specific domain, or perhaps with Uwe a little bit more kind of, so how are we gonna do the scaling, or how are we gonna address some of the things that you mentioned in your last answer? But the next five to 10 years, and I'll, I'll start with Louise on this one. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I think there are a lot of opportunities, and so, um, there are many more tools to uh, probe uh, bacteria and fungi and other microorganisms, algae, that were available in the past. I'm thinking of CRISPR-Cas. And so it really allows the development of these new systems to do novel things. Um, and also sequencing to understand the ecology of organisms uh, in nature doing metagenomics, for example, and how perturbations affect those populations. And so I think that there are the the advent of this new technology really opens up opportunities to exploit those systems, for example, carbon sequestration and seed amendments and uh, agriculture. Thanks for that. Uh, Chris? Yeah, I, I really agree with what Louise just said there. Um, I, I see a big challenge for the next five to 10 years is uh, taking the, our fundamental mechanistic uh, understanding of biology and applying it to problems like climate change. I really think this is an existential problem for humanity that we need to address. And I plan to devote much of my time remaining here at Cal to, to try to, to do just that. Um, yeah, and I, and I think another aspect, again, that kind of brings it back to PMB and what I said initially is that uh, you know, many of us in the lab focus on individual isolated organisms. And I think increasingly we need to look at communities of organisms and the interactions between them in the natural environment. And yeah, Louise is, for example, doing some amazing work related to that. And, and many of the people in PMB are as well, other people in PMB. So I, I see that as a really important future direction. Thanks for that. Next five to 10 years, Uwe. Yeah, um, so my, my perspective is a little biased toward the industry because I guess I'm thinking on uh, what, how do we really best translate these great technologies into a product and, or into a applicable technologies that actually has a business case. Um, so the thing, um, I'm not the most creative person, so I guess you probably heard this many times, probably, um, leveraging the power of AI or machine learning and combining the uh, fundamental knowledge of um, biology to uh, really rapidly um, screen through and mine through the, the massive data that we are learning from our fundamental research. For example, um, one research area we are foc uh, focusing on is utilizing machine learning to drive the fermenter. So for example, in fermentation processes, you have to um, define the best pH, best processing temperature, the downstream, the upstream. Uh, could we use 
almost like a self-driving car, could we use machine learning to um, to self to to build a self-driving for mentor so that um, the uh, scaled up process will, will uh, wouldn't be as uh, a black magic? Because uh, right now, honestly, people just um, take a laboratory scale process and uh, um, use some boilerplate um, process conditions and hope for the best, uh, move to a big reactor and hope for the best. Um, could we really bring um, almost like an intelligent approach to um, to turn some of this um, black magic almost aspect of uh, biology into uh, into into uh, more controlled uh, experiments? Yeah. Well, I love the comment that you made, and it's very much in keeping with sort of the modern way that we teach and, and provide opportunities around entrepreneurship, the idea that the scientific method is as relevant for developing a business as it is for developing the science underneath it. There are hypotheses. You need to test those hypotheses. What are the hypotheses? How are you going to test them, right? So the idea that we put our science hats down and then we become entrepreneurs. No, the entrepreneurship area has very much gone into, let's use the tools of the method and, and, and advance that way. So this next question is, relates to some of the stuff you've talked about, but it's, it, the question is about how exciting this moment is, right? I kind of started by saying, why didn't I choose your field? Some of that is because, as was discussed, I'm, I'm helping a whole team of people that are working on Baker Bioingenuity Hub, or, but you could mention so many different things that are going on on campus. Um, your, your department has been a societal game changer for a long time. The pandemic has shifted life and work expectations. We, we've got brand new initiatives on campus, hubs geared towards Toward expanding societal and economic op uh, opportunities. Do you feel this buzz? Do your students feel this buzz? A couple of comments on that. Chris, please. Yeah, definitely. Um, I was just reading the other day about uh, uh, the number of cluster hires that are taking place on our campus right now. You know, I think we were a beneficiary of one of those first cluster hires in the area of biology, and there are now a number of those going on, not necessarily in the space of entrepreneurship, but uh, in, in uh, a, a lot of uh, areas that are related to uh, equity, inclusion, uh, social justice, things like that. Um, I, I really look forward to seeing yeah, where these hires lead in terms of the directions it pushes our campus. and. Uh, I think that's a really great way to, to hire and uh, to, to get new faculty on the campus. Thanks for that. Uwe. Yeah, um, I think now is a great time to be a student at, at UC Berkeley. It's definitely an exciting time. Um, when I came to UC Berkeley, I didn't realize or even thought, thought about that I will become an entrepreneur. Um, so it's just, a, a, honestly, like a random, uh, um, a series of random events. Um, Professor John Coase introduced me to a director at the NSF Equips program, and that person really opened the door to, for me um, to the a vast amount of entrepreneurship um, resources that are available on, on campus. I know Haas has under, uh, entrepreneurship program. Uh, I know NSF iCorps has programs here. I know ha uh, law school has uh, uh, startup law programs. Um, so all these um, resources are really um, helped to cultivate um, this UC Berkeley entrepreneurship uh, spirit. Thanks for that. Please, Louise. I think uh, being a graduate student or a postdoc now, um, you have just many more opportunities than when I was a graduate student where we pretty much had tunnel vision and you just didn't really think outside of your experiments, writing a thesis, getting a job. And so I think the sort of integration of different expertise and, and thinking about, um, for example, aspects of social justice included in your uh, thesis or interacting with people that think about that, all of that enriches your perspective. And that enriched perspective, I think, really affects what choices you make in the future. And the more informed you are, the better choices you're going to make in the future. And so I think the department has really made a huge effort in the past two years to kind of bring that perspective with some of the DEI activities and the book clubs. And, um, and I think that that has really enriched our community. And, and, I, and I think that that will make a big difference going forward. Thank you. So this next question is about the cross-cultural role for your science. It was mentioned by our keynote speaker, so I want to drill into that a little bit more. That, it, that, that your science, and science more generally, has this powerful cross-cultural role, or the potential to play an even larger role that way in an, in an often fractured world. We've all seen that. Uh, could you speak to 
the science and PMB's value as a connector of people across culture, science as an ambassador, science as a change maker. Uh, why don't we start with you, Uwe? Yeah, um, I think science is definitely a great unifier um, for people across different culture, and PMB especially as one of the most the best microbiology and plant science department in the world, attracting people from diverse different backgrounds and that with um, diverse experience. Uh, I think a good uh, research team should compose of people that actually. Um, from diverse um, background and with complementary skill set. Uh, so for example, when we first started, um, this is definitely uh, not intentional. Our our core team actually was born from four different, like four of us was born from four different continents, right? Like I was from Asia, John's from Europe, uh, Audrey's from Africa, uh, and Shannon's from America. So it, I, think, I think science is definitely this great unifier that bring people together and learn uh, from each other and, and really grow to be a better um, better people together. Thank you for that. I think, you know, that notion of the, of the team, I guess at least me in my own simplistic way of thinking about science, especially when I was younger, the idea of the individual contributor and its boy, is it, is it a team sport now, right? Great science. I guess it always has been, but it feels like it's only going further in that direction. So same, same question to you, uh, Louise, please. Pleasure in my life to have all of the uh, people who worked with me over the years, and many of them are from diverse backgrounds, diverse places, and it has been um, not only uh, great on a personal level, getting to know people and working with them over the years, but also on a cultural level because they bring a different perspective because they come from a different place um, in the on Earth. And so I think that that's um, really beneficial. And so there, you have diversity of, of backgrounds, but I think also to kind of go back to something that I talked about before, that you can also have diversity of perspectives and diversity of expertise. And I think that that uh, has also been something that's been really um, enriching, is having people from different expertise, um, proteomics, metabolomics, uh, protein structure to go along with our genetics, machine learning. Uh, and that has, has, is also, I think, an important aspect of, um, of this place and this department for sure. Thanks for that. Um, so I, did you get a chance to answer that one, Chris? Not, not yet. yet. Please, to you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, this is not yeah, necessarily specific to PMB, but I think the cross-cultural cross -cultural aspects of science and the, how international it is is really one of the most uh, enjoyable aspects of science. Uh, so whether it's like a, a lab potluck where you have you know dishes that are prepared by people from all over the world, or uh, the chance to go to international conferences and meet colleagues in other countries, that is really an amazing thing that we're able to do. And uh, you know it's made harder now, uh, but uh, I, and in some ways Zoom has actually made that even more accessible. The ability to communicate with colleagues uh, all across the globe. We need, we need your glue. We need your glue. But the next three questions are a little bit more personal. So um, I'm going to ask you to open up a little bit here. Why, who do you admire and why? Louise, could, could you start on that tough question? That is a tough question. Um, and I did think about it, and I felt like, well, I, I don't have a favorite person, I guess. Um, and so the thing that popped into my head was the department. Um, I really value the department and all the different voices in the department, um, from uh, undergrads all the way up to uh, emeritus and, so, and staff. And so I think that that has been um, a, a real pleasure for me. And I, that's who I admire and I value are the people that are around me every day. Love it. Love it. Well, you know, at some level, we're all volunteers, and you are here because you feel that way. And uh, it is a great thing for all of us that you do. Thank you for that. Uwe, why don't you go next? Thanks. Yeah, um, so I have massive amount of respect for people on um, just um, don't give up. That, especially in science, right? It's so easy to give up. You work on a project, it doesn't work, you just leave. Um, I know a person worked on a project for many, many years and preserved um, to the end and uh, published a great paper in the end and even discovered um, evidence of a new carbon fixation pathway. That's Israel Figueroa. I really have a lot of respect for him. And I think that's also part of the PMB spirit that we just keep 
attacking a difficult, pro uh, diff difficult problem from all different angles, and in the end, we, we solve uh, the mystery. Thanks for that, Chris. Yeah, it is a tough question, and I'm going to, I guess, make it kind of personal. Uh, I really admire my, my mom, Audrey Stevens. Um, yeah, she was a scientist uh, like me, but she, like uh, Xing Wang Deng said, came from very humble beginnings growing up on a small family farm in Nebraska. Uh, was one of the first to get a PhD from the university she went to, uh, did a fellowship at NIH, uh, was a co-discoverer of RNA polymerase, and was elected to the National Academy the same year that Brian Staskowitz was, actually. So yeah, I'm just incredibly proud of her, and I just admire her, her so much, yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. The next question is related, but a little different. As so many of the people in this audience know, the, the quality of the mentors slash sponsors in your life just have a fundamental impact on, on what you become and the opportunities available to you. And it's important that we, we pay that back, pay that forward. But uh, could you talk a little bit about, specifically about mentoring? It may, it may connect to your who you admire uh, answer. But um, who, who's, who's played an, a, a role as mentor to you specifically, and what, what made them great mentors? Um, Chris, could you do this one first? Sure, yeah. So yeah, maybe just picking up where I, I left off there. So uh, I, one of the reasons I admire my mother so much is uh, what she taught me about science. So. Uh, the importance of a strong work ethic, working hard, and also she taught me what, what creativity in science means. Um, and then I, more, yeah, in PMB, uh, I, I wanna give a shout out to Russell Jones, who has been uh, my senior faculty mentor for, for the entire time that I've been here. He was actually the chair of the search committee when I was hired, and we share a, a common love of soccer and a lot of other aspects of life that uh, uh, has been a really enjoyable thing to share over these uh, 20 plus years that I've been here. And he, he is someone who just knows this campus really well, and he was just the perfect mentor for me to sort of tell me how, how things really work here. And I really appreciate that. That's great. You know, R Russell's, I might be the first person from your department that I got to know on campus through some, uh, some Senate work. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'd like to say I'm as fond of him as you are. You know him so much better than I am, than I do. But he is just a remarkable, remarkable person. Uh, Uwe, how about, how about this question for you? Yeah, I have two people um, in mind. One is definitely Professor John Coase. I was in his lab for eight years. And John really encouraged um, academic, almost like a research, uh, research, in a way like a research freedom. Like, Uwe, what is the best question that you actually care? Something that, you know, um, light you up, that uh, you have a passion and work on that, and really encouraged us to work on a question that we are really passionate about, and I really appreciate that. Uh, and John also uh, never give up, right? He uh, really, you really have to bring the most conclusive negative data to say, like, John, this, you know, <laughs> is not, it's not going to work. Uh, people. So you never left to wonder, um, like, whether, um, you know, I just didn't try hard enough or the project was actually um, not going to work. Um, the second person is uh, my wife, uh, so, yeah, Charlie, and she's uh, I'm like a very um, by the book person. I don't, I always go with the easiest explanation, whereas she always think outside the box, and I really appreciate that as well. Love it. Thank uh, you for that. Thank you, Louise. Yeah. Um, yeah, besides the mentors that I had in graduate school and postdoc, since I've been here, I want to acknowledge my fungal colleagues. John Taylor, Tom Bruns, and more recently, Rachel Bram. They are a fantastic group of people to work with. And especially John Taylor, because he always, I would go into his office and he, his first answer or would be, or question would be, why not? Be like, why not do that? Or why not sequence 100 strains? Why not? And so he was always an incredible optimist. And the other person that I want to acknowledge is Chris Somerville. Um, Chris headed the EBI when I was part of the EBI, and he was just an incredible leader to watch during that process. Um, and his um, ability to inspire 500 people across three different campuses to try to solve uh, biofuel problems from, again, a uniquely integrated approach. Uh, and uh, I have to, um, he, he was really fantastic to interact with. And he also, um, worked from first principles. And what I mean by that is that you have to understand the problem before you solve the problem. And that's really the basis of 
basic research is to understand the problem, and then once you can understand it, then you can manipulate it to solve some of these problems. And he was a huge advocate for that. He's one of the people who started Arabidopsis for plant biology, and for biofuels, he let me work on Neurospora, even though it was not an industrial organism. Um, and so I have to really credit him. Thank you for those thoughts from all of you. So this is the last question, and this one is fairly open-ended. It's really closing thoughts, whether you want to look out sort of lo long-term on PMB or just in general anything we've discussed. How about some closing thoughts? We'll, we'll start with you, Uwe. Thank you. Um, so I really, PM, PMB is a great department. I really enjoyed my time here. Um, I hope, I really firmly believe that PMB in the next 10 years or like even um, later will continue to produce groundbreaking researches and uh, uh, continue to um, generate groundbreaking discoveries for the uh, for better humanity. Uh, also, I really hope that uh, PMB continue to unleash the um, uh, entrepreneurial spirit of UC Berkeley uh, so that uh, we help people, uh, we help uh, to translate this groundbreaking technologies, discoveries uh, to applicable technology and products to uh, make an impact to the society. Um, and yeah, and in the end, hope to see you all again 10 years later in the next 10 year anniversary. You're here, maybe in eight, because we'll be due. Oh, yes. uh, Louise, <laughs> we'll, we'll, go, we'll go next to you, please. Okay. Um, yeah, I just want to, uh, it's very exciting to have new faculty in our department and very vibrant new faculty. And so actually yesterday at the PMB retreat was the first time that I've met many of the new faculty that were hired in the last uh, 18 months. And so that was really exciting. And so I really look forward to seeing where the department evolves over the next uh, 20 years. Um, and I'm really also hoping that there's some wine left. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't have any before now. <laughs> so that's my final word. Look, looking out long term, Louise, thank you for that. Uh, over to you, Chris. Yeah, um, I, I agree with Louise that uh, uh, the new faculty that we've hired over the last five years or so has really uh, made me very optimistic about the future of this department. I think there was a time like, uh, you know, when Louise was chair and I was chair. Uh, when we were very concerned about the future because we could see this retirement cliff with all of our outstanding faculty approaching retirement age and we were uh, not able to hire new faculty and th the new faculty are really the lifeblood of the department and they bring all kinds of creativity new approaches new ways of thinking and uh, from what i've seen so far we're in really good hands for the future Thank you all so much. You know, I think just one quick comment, and that is, um, you know, I think when we, when we ask kind of about why does this institution exist, it's, it's one of society's most important assets, and I think for, for all of us, it's at the end of the day, it's about impact. It's about long-term impact, but it's about impact. And when we start thinking about whether it's the fundamental research we do or the translation, as Uwe pointed to it, that, that, that we do of that to, to really improve society, it, it feels to me, as a relative outsider, like your department has never had more opportunity to contribute both on the, you know, the upstream side of that and on the downstream side of that. So it's super exciting to me. Um, let's give these three wonderful panelists a hand, please. Thanks. And I think uh, John or someone is going to lead us to the next step. Thank you all three very much. All right. Well, thank you very much, panelists and Rich, for that wonderful discussion. And just from my own personal perspective, I'd like to say how incredibly proud I am to have been part of this department for the last 20 years. As everybody has mentioned up here, it really is a remarkable place. And how could it not be when we have graduate students like OA who, uh, and alumni like OA who go on to such amazing successes? So congratulations, congratulations all of you, and uh, thank you for that wonderful uh, discussion. So now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Corinne Gibbs, who will announce the Student uh, 2021 Poster Awards. Uh, Corinne? 
And when, as she works her way up here, I'd just like to mention again that Corinne is one of the brand new faculty in our department uh, who most of us haven't met in person until very recently. I was fortunate enough to have met her long ago because we interacted during the whole interview process. Well, Corinne, come up. Thank you again for everyone participating um, in the retreat and the poster pitches. So for the best poster pitch, Christine Kabar. Mm -hmm. We will save this in Joanne's office for her. And then uh, for best poster presentations, we have two winners, Sebastian Fernandez and Adrian Belencor. Come on up if you're here still. Thank you. And so that concludes our program for today. We have some refreshments afterwards over here at Pat Brown's. Um, and thank you again. <laughs>